So, colleagues, greetings and welcome back. So, hopefully we are live. Um, today, I want to continue. I mean, we, we've been talking about politics uh, uh, yesterday. So, I thought we'd continue uh, um, with a political topic today. So, specifically, you know, I mentioned a couple of things about uh, natural rights last time. Um, and I want to... Um, I want to return to this discussion and maybe make it somewhat more precise. So, uh, philosophically speaking, I am a big opponent of the natural rights tradition. Uh, I don't think it works uh, philosophically in the sense that I don't think that there's um, any reasonable way to decide what the natural rights are on which everybody should agree, like natural inalienable rights, whatever that is. So, the, uh, my position is that uh, morality in general is constructed so and and um, therefore the notion of moral ethical individual good but also of political good has to be constructed on the basis of common interest so it's not like i think rights are bad and we should have no rights and we should i don't know die or suffer no no, no that's not the point um of course the individuals the, the political system may decide to give individual rights and protect those rights but these rights have to be constructed by a public discourse the free and equal discussion i was talking about last time right and again, and this, this notion that uh, it is on the basis of the common interest that we create society and, protect those rights. and uh, it is on the basis of common interest that we decide a public what, discourse. Uh, um, free and equal what kind of natural, about sorry, what kind of rights do again, we want people this, to this have? Notion that but rights uh, do not exist, base, so to speak, before uh, the natural society. And society has to, uh, has to decide what the rights are going to be based on common interest, right? And I feel it's a very important uh, point, and I mentioned how I, 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 I'm afraid uh, that um, the uh, discourse of rights very often is deeply divisive, and uh, I want to like oppose to that um, the discourse of common interest. So let me, yeah. So this is this is in in many ways okay, so natural. Are divisive. So this is this is this is a standard position. I mean, for example, David Hume would, would take a similar position, um, and very very importantly, Karl Marx writes about how uh, 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 natural rights are, again, to oversimplify, the tool used by the bourgeoisie to keep the uh, proletariat separated. Mm. And uh, let me say something which I think is not said often enough. I'm talking about common interest, very importantly. So, common interest as an alternative to natural rights discourse. And um, so the, the, po the point is, we are not, this is the problem with natural rights. Natural rights, I feel, very often focus on grievances. One person wrongs another person. You have broken my natural rights and therefore some punishment is in order, right? Common interest talks about what can we do so that everybody benefits. How can we arrange a society in such a way that everybody benefits? So the thing that's not said often enough is that my reading of Marx, I think that the only correct way of reading Marx is that communism is in the interest of everybody. It's like a new stage of human evolution. It is not the revenge of the poor against the rich. So uh, uh, Marx's communism... Is, is not revenge, right? Well, I mean, it is, uh, uh, you know, in everyone's interest. And is not revenge. And this is, this is why I talked about flame wars last time, because it seems that so much of discussion I hear uh, you know, in the streets, in the news, in the media, especially especially on the on the internet, so much of discussion. Um, maybe people's hearts are in the right place, but very often any kind of productive discussion very quickly spirals out of control and turns into a flame war, where people get, get their passions high. It's a good it's a good question. Why do people why are people so prone to flame wars? Maybe I'm not an expert, but maybe this has to do with something with our hunter gathering ancestors and this is sort of tribal instincts. But again, not revenge of uh, 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 poor versus the rich. Or, let's say, of females versus males. Or of, uh, I don't know, of slaves versus free. 
or of uh, uh, you know the colonized populations versus uh, you know the, whatever the colonizers, right? It's not the revenge. On the contrary, it is the common interest. And again, the the, the idea is that um, it is part. And I I feel that Zizek, Zizek. Let me let me write Zizek uh, with a question mark here because I feel that Zizek makes this point that very often again. What capitalism can do, what the capitalist class uh, intentionally or unintentionally can do, ideology doesn't have to be intentional. What they can do is they can play on divisions, right? So this is the strategy of divide and conquer. And the, 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 po the point is to avoid that, right? The point is to find common ground, common ground of productive discussion, right? So... It's a complicated topic, and I want to do it justice. And the, I understand that all these examples are controversial, but I want to maybe try to get into the weeds a little bit. Again, uh, well, I mean, let's, let's start somewhere. When I first started teaching in university, I very strongly identified as a feminist. And I've been talking about feminism a lot. And I've been, I, I like this label, and I kept pushing this, pushing this label. And... The, your experience may be completely different. But what happened to me is whenever I sp I've spoken about the issue of feminism, I would see bizarreness reaction from students. Again, I was a young teacher and I had students. And uh, um, a large proportion, this may be due to you know regional or cultural variations, but a large proportion of my students were outraged and appalled by me identifying as a feminist. And this sounded to me very strange because secretly what i had in well I, I don't want to say secretly but actually what i had in mind is common interest right i was a young you know adolescent male just graduated and i thought that we all have a common cause against the patriarchy the uh, you know our social system is less than perfect there's all sorts of room for abuses i've spoken about this last time uh yeah maybe maybe i should bring this back today so there's free and equal discussion this is what we want but then there's patrimonialism there's corruption there's a, a, a course of laws of competition market, which is capitalism. There's state bureaucracy, and maybe also there's flame wars, whatever. But what we want is free and equal discussion, right? And I thought that very clearly we have a common cause against patriarchy, against you know certain imperfections in our system, and like having a, a, a more more equitable, wider access to education, fairer grading system, fairer system of I don't know allocating research grants or teaching positions would be better for everyone. Equality of opportunity, meritocracy, that kind of thing. But what, 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 what I found out is that very often when people talk about feminism, they don't mean that. They, 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 don't, they don't mean let's have you know, more and better uh, you know, equality of opportunity such that everybody will benefit. And again, notice, notice, I feel it's worth spelling out, right? So my uh, um, point, again, I broadly speaking already identified as a well i don't say identity this sounds stupid this is not a case of identity i've been i've been reading marx for my whole life and i found marx useful back then i still find marx useful now right so for me it was a question of common interest it was a question of what can we do to make everybody's lives better let me give you an example again this i i i've told you i read marx through Mill and nietzsche nietzsche and i feel that it's important to read Mill and nietzsche through marx as well right so Mill says Come on, if you're not mm, giving equality of, of opportunity to, uh, let's say, women in research fields, and there's, you know, regions vary, disciplines vary, but it's very clear that in some places of the world today, in some disciplines, it's very hard for women to get a job, proper job in, in an academia, right? And, you know, we can discuss why exactly is that the case? What can we do to rem remedy that? But that's, that's the point. There's, there's some level of systematic bias, some level of oppression. And the point is that if we get over this bias, everybody will benefit because, let's say, let's say uh, you know, it's, it's a field that has to do with physics. So once we let women into the field, there's going to be more talent. There's going to be more competition. And therefore, we're going to have better scientific results. We'll understand physics better. Or we will understand medicine better. You see? See? Kind of... I'm not talking about revenge. It's not like, oh, males are so evil. Let's, you know, let's punish them and let, let's take something away from them and give something back to the females. That's divisive. 
that's, uh, you know, that's conflictual. That, that, that's starting a flame war. You know, talking about male privilege, again, I feel it's, it's, a, uh, it's a dangerous, harmful, harmful phrase that is created as if specifically to divide and outrage people. And again, so it's like, let me, let me, let me be careful about this, okay? So people will often say, look, uh, a certain group of individuals, they have problems, so it's good to call attention to their problems. And I want to say, as a hypothesis, we should be careful when we say that calling attention to a problem is always a good thing, because, you know, attention span is limited, and sometimes wrong kind of propaganda can lead to more harm than good. So it's like, let's, let's take this as a, as, a, as a hypothesis. So it could be, so maybe, you know, free and equal discussion, this is a hypothesis, maybe uh, a wrong kind of advocacy can lead to more harm than good. Maybe rights-based advocacy can lead to more harm than good. Again, I want to be careful. Let's let's ask this with, with a question mark because you know I'm not sure. You, see, it needs, you need to do a study. But this is this is my impression. This is also very much an impression of me talking to my students, right? Because mm. I feel that people who would be receptive to a socialist message, people who would be receptive to a gender gender equality message, or people who would be receptive, let's say, to uh, you know preventing cruelty towards animals message, that these people get turned off by particular kinds of discourses that see, you know have this conflictual element, element of you know, blame and starting a flame war, right? And again, you see, uh, uh, it's like if if it was the case that we had no common interest, right? So let's say us and the coronavirus. Presumably, we have no no common interest. This is this is war. We're trying to destroy coronavirus. Imagine you have some sort of a species of animal. So this is a hypothetical scenario that is really deleterious to, to humans, right? So um, ecosystems are complicated, so it rarely works this way. But imagine you have invasive species of mosquitoes that destroys the ecology and also makes human life miserable. Or you have like invasive species of rats, maybe, that will ruin the local ecosystem and also will destroy humans, right? So this legitimate, re you know, this, there's a way, and Rousseau talks about this again, common interest, general will, right? Um, Rousseau talks about this, right? So between us and the invasive species of rat, maybe there is no common interest, maybe it's just war. Between us and the invasive species of mosquitoes, maybe there is no common interest, maybe it's just war. Again, for the sake of the argument, because we're on the internet, of course, sometimes it's not the case. And in fact, my ecologist friends tell me that if we destroy all mosquitoes on planet Earth, uh, yeah, maybe it would help uh, ourselves with diseases a little bit. But then we would also wreck certain uh, ecosystems, chains, and in the end, human beings will suffer. So it means that maybe us and mosquitoes have a common interest, right? <laughs> and I want to focus on that, right? So it's like, imagine somebody cares about animal rights. And I see, again, I, uh, and, you know, I have... 20 lectures or something talking about this stuff elsewhere, right? But I feel that the idea of natural rights is incoherent. And, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. Do animals have rights? Sometimes students ask me this, you know, and it's a difficult question, but I want to say, like, within the frameworks in which we are working, starting with Thomas Hobbes, you know, social contract, reciprocity, rights presuppose duties, and they also, like, reciprocity presupposes mutual obligation. Animals cannot have mutual obligations with human beings. Like, you, you cannot take an animal to court. You could say, well, but what about children or what about people with brain damage? Well, you see, children, we, we expect them to grow up, and people with brain damage sometimes recover, right? But if, if a person's brain damage is such that we pronounce them clinically dead, then they no longer have rights. So, you know, it's a kind of a moot point. Again, I haven't thought about this for a very long time, but my preliminary understanding is that probably when we talk about free and equal discussion, we're talking about free and equal discussion between agents who, 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 have, who, can, who can have certain kind of reciprocity be, between them. So you, you can imagine having a free and equal discussion between us and a species of, a, of aliens, but not animals, presently speaking. But that's not to say, and again, again, you see, very often people phrase this in terms of like, meat eaters are harming um, the, the animals and they're performing some crime, and that's, you know, uh, you know horrible sin, right? And... Uh, um, I, th I feel that there's all sorts of problems with this discourse, but I want to, and again, like the, 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 the place I'm coming from in many ways when talking about this is Antonio Gramsci. And Antonio Gramsci talks about how the party 
the Communist Party it has to be the new the new prince. So it means you have to organize you ha your your tactics has to be thought out. Do no harm. It's like communism, scientific scientific versus utopian social is about achieving results. What is the recipe that gets us to a better future, to a better better future for everyone? And again, again, again. I talked about this. Maybe we have no common interest with the invasive species of rats, but as human beings, we have all these wonderful capacities to produce science, to produce art, to produce music, to produce literature, to make everybody's lives better. So it's, you know, prima facie, I assume that all human beings have a very robust common interest. And, you know, Marx says this, but also Adam Smith says this. And John Locke says this. I, I, let's think about Adam, I, I mean, within the, the liberal tradition, or, or John Stuart Mill says this, right? Within the liberal tradition, again, you do what's good for you, I do what's good for me, but through the invisible hand of the market, we benefit everybody. Marx does not exactly buy the picture of invisible hand of the market, but there is something um, remotely resembling invisible hand of the market in communism. Marx insists that in communism, there is no difference between altruism and egoism, or, or people are not asked to sacrifice themselves. And again, 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 I, 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 I mentioned this. I mentioned this a second ago. I said that we don't want natural rights. We don't want this revenge and conflict. We want to, we want to emphasize common interest. And I feel that very often feminist discourse doesn't em emphasize this enough. Uh, um, animal welfare discourse doesn't emphasize this enough. And socialist discourse doesn't emphasize this enough. So, you know, I think Marxists in general are also very much to blame for this because very often people talk about Marxism as if it's a revenge of the poor against the rich. And that's just, that's not the way I see uh, Marx. And again, if, if it was, if it was the case that the bourgeoisie and the proletariat simply have a, opposing, have no common ground, have no common ground of interest, then I would say that there's no reason to advocate for communism, for, for socialism as a, as a, as a, as a better, uh, uh, you know, as a better alternative, because it's not a question of advocacy, it's a question of, like, us versus them, it's, you know, but, but is it, but is it, that's the point. Anyway, and, you know, we presume that the bourgeoisie is going to have to give up something on the road to the socialist future the same way that the feudal lords had to give up something when the feudal privileges were abolished. But in the end, it's like it is a better distribution uh, of uh, benefits for everyone, even the, the, the feudal lords themselves and their children benefit more from a democratic system than, you know, than they would if we had stayed with the abusive and violent uh, feudal system. Not to mention that, again, the point is that feudal system is unsustainable, it just collapses in on itself. Well, I mean... In, in the long run, it's like, well, does it actually collapse? Well, for Marx, it, it, it gets outcompeted by capitalism, but you, but you understand, right? There's violence in the system, and sometimes there's a peasant uprising, and peasants kill certain members of the, you know, feudal lords and, and their families. So there's, there's, there's this cost as well. So it's like staying with feudal privileges is not exactly in the cards. But, but, again, but again, the point is that, a, and notice, I would expect far fewer people find this controversial, right? Giving up feudal privileges is giving up, Right? But then it's in the common interest. And notice, what would people say from the standpoint of natural rights? So uh, let, me, let me add this, you know, uh, natural rights in question. Natural feudal rights? Natural feudal rights. You know, divine right of kings. You know, it's like um, taking away uh, feudal privileges. That's, that's encroachment on the rights of the feudal lords, right? <laughs> uh, and, and, and for me, kind of all of, all of these discussions about, uh, you know, uh, gun rights, you know, ownership of uh, gunpowder-based arms, whatever, weapons, right? Uh, or, you know, property rights, or, or, or taxation, people who say that all taxation is theft. Um, I want to say, again, it's like society decides what property rights should be and what should be the limit of property rights. Because you could say, you know, what, what belongs to you? M let's say my hand or my toothbrush. What about my car or my house? So your hand and your toothbrush are clearly yours, but your car also could produce emissions, you could get into accidents, you know, this, John, you know, don't even go to Marx, think about John Stuart Mill. There's valid concerns, concerns from the standpoint of, of harm principle that maybe your ownership of your car or of your house has to be regulated, right? But then think about things such as, you know, my poison, or my plutonium, uh, 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 or, or, or uranium, or something like that. We don't allow private individuals to possess plutonium and uranium, you know, for, like, why? 
Why can you possess a toothbrush and cannot possess a piece of plutonium? Isn't that some kind of you know, uh, uh, violence? Well, again, the, the, the idea is that, you know, you think in terms of the common interest. Uh, what is the best arrangement, right? And, and, and you can continue. How about my uh, machine gun? Machine gun. Or my slave. Again, it's like, uh, um, when I say machine gun, let's, let's, let's not write machine gun, because Switzerland allows citizens to... Um, Possess machine guns, and Switzerland is actually a pretty nice country to live. So let's say my atomic bomb, atomic bomb, or or my, my slave, and 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 what about what about what about copyright? My copyright, right? So, you know, imagine imagine if we had a different copyright legislation, such that all of the like like a, a, a primogeniture, the oldest uh, heir to Plato has complete rights over all of Plato's works and nobody's ever allowed to cite Plato without without paying them a royalty. That you know, that's that's a possible arrangement and it would be an encroachment on the rights of that person, right? Uh, to cite Plato without paying them money, but probably the progress of humanity would be stifled. Again, the the justification for us having copyrights and patents supposedly is that it is in the common interest it it's, it's not because individuals have wholly sacred and inalienable rights towards what they have produced. Now, the point the point is that uh, um, it makes everybody better off because it stimulates creativity. Patents protect, you know, protect, uh, it's like patents provide stimulus. They, they stimulate uh, creativity of engineers and, that, and that's why they're useful, but patents are only given for a short period of time because after that, uh, they, they, they stop stimulating creativity and just become a way of extracting quasi-feudal privileges, right? Not to mention that, again, no person is an island. You know, it's like no inventor ever invents in a vacuum. You know, society gives, always gives something to you. It teaches you how to speak. It, uh, you know, gives you education, often free education, you know, takes care of you. So it's kind of, it's appropriate that society asks for something in return. Now, of course, there's a huge question about conflict and consensus because societies are different. Some societies are more conflictual. Some societies are more consensual. And sometimes, sometimes, I'm not saying it's impossible because in some societies, uh, uh, the level of consensus is very, is very, is very tiny, and in fact, society is just mostly abusive and mostly just takes care, just takes advantage of you. Hegel talks about this when he talks about Pebel, the rabble, or you can imagine, you know, like uh, 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 poor slaves who are exploited by the system. Now, you wouldn't expect them to, uh, to, to, to obey the norms of your society. You wouldn't expect them to respect your laws of justice because if you have this abusive relationship where they get nothing out of it. But you see, again, rights often, you know, I don't want to say often, but always, always. In order to make the notion of rights uh, 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 rigorous and precise, you need to appeal to common interest. That's 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 my assertion. So, um, so let me let me let me finish. So, uh, the rights of uh, uh, you know, in general, categories who are oppressed. Let's say women or the poor, or. Um, uh, racial minorities, racial or ethnic, ethnic minorities, or, um, well, I mean, talk about talk about animal welfare, right? The point is that I feel that there's a very strong case to be made that we have a huge overlapping common interest, right? So. I mentioned this last time. Again, I am a white male, right? But I have a, a common interest with you know black females in sub-Saharan Africa, because if they get access to a good, high-quality education, then you know they will be in a position to cure my cancer, right? And sort of everything I see about the way the social system works, uh, you know, su suggests to me that in a well-ordered society, that's the case. Human beings sometimes restrict one another, but mostly we enable each other, right? And notice, notice, notice also, so let's, let's take this example of taxation. So if you, if you focus on this rights-based approach and you say, oh, you know, the rich have rights to their wealth and now we tax them and we take something, steal something away forcefully from them and give it to the poor. You see, that, that's, a, that's a conflictual way of putting it. So conflictual way of putting it, it's like a theft, right? But you can also have a consensual way of putting it. And the consensual way of putting it uh, um, consensual way of putting it would be I, as a person of some wealth, I would be happy to give some of my resources to provide for my fellow citizens. So it's Rousseau's general will. Rousseau's general will. Because my fellow citizens 
are my only protection against uh, enemies abroad and tyrants at home. Against enemies abroad and tyrants at home. So you see, it's a very different logic. As a rich person in this, in this category, uh, uh, I would be happy to pay taxes because I know, again, Rousseau's general will, in a true social contract, right? Uh, I know that my taxes will it's like, go towards my own protection, right? <laughs> me, me, kind of my, my own safeguard. And again, I mentioned this last time. So it's like you have, we have plastic. I have a common interest with so many people, with the vast majority of the rest of planet Earth, with some except, you know, if some people are mad or psychopaths or something, like uh, David Hume would say, they're not, strictly speaking, not, we call them immoral because, not because they, have, they are irrational, but because they are inhuman. So some people who don't care that the Earth will be destroyed by a meteorite or who don't care that we are poisoning ourselves with plastic, uh, um, with these kinds of people, maybe I, I don't have any common interest, but I would imagine this is a tiny, tiny proportion of the population. The vast majority of people would care about what does plastic do to your system, right? And um, whether it's safe to drink or, you know, whether microplastic can have some deleterious effects. And, and we may want to get on board with this. But kind of the idea of the, like, what I'm driving at is that I feel that we do have potentially a general will with the rest of humanity. And the, the question is a technical question. It's a technical issue of how do we get there. So I want to say, the way I see it, and very often people say, oh, politics is so complicated, values are so complicated. I, I think, no, values are not complicated. Politics is not complicated. Politics is simply about common interest. So the polit political philosophy is very simple and has been solved. Sorry, you know, I'm being slightly facetious. You understand that. Rhetorical trick on my part. Politics is simply about common interest. Philosophically, there's nothing complicated about this. So philosophically, this is super easy. It's as easy as can be. But the problem is, practically, this is super hard, of course, because practically, figuring out, you know, but practically, it's super hard. So it's like, you know, think of the coronavirus. The, um, you know, what do you, what do you, what do you do with the coronavirus? Philosophically, philosophically, it's very easy. You find a cure. You find a, some uh, uh, pharma pharmaceuticals or, you, you know, lockdowns, pharmaceuticals, you find vaccines, right, that work. So philosophically, coronavirus is not a problem, but technically speaking, you know, pra putting this into practice can be a very difficult challenge. So in the, in the same fashion, I feel that it's like a, 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 a functioning, equitable Republican system, rep democratic Republican system, in which uh, uh, people have uh, uh, access to, uh, to education, resources for self-development, and very importantly, resources and actual effective capacity to participate in politics, right? So this, this, you know, when I talk about Marx, this is what I mean. I don't mean revenge of poor against rich. I mean that the only way that democracy can work is that if an individual citizen has enough resources to develop themselves. So individuals, and notice again, it's like capitalist collectivism, communist individualism. Communism is based on the individual, the free development of each as a condition for the free development of all, each individual. So individuals who are uh, uh, free, autonomous, uh, free, autonomous development, so that, you know, first of all, they will, well, I mean, they will contribute, and this is a common cause between Marx and Mill, uh, 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 because for, you know, because human, human, human beings are, you know, human nature is essentially creative. And I believe that's true. And again, what I'm doing right now, I'm creating. It's uh, my best attempt to give the best lecture I can with 10 years of teaching experience. This is my best attempt. I'm doing something creative, but I'm also doing this on Sunday. I'm doing this completely for fun. So, and from everything I've seen, uh, you know, throughout the world and in my interactions, this is, this, is, this is what it tells me, that in a well-ordered society, in a well-functioning society, the vast majority of individuals are in a very good position to contribute to the common good, right? Mm. But also, in addition to that, maybe even before that, we need transparency and accountability. And so it's like, uh, 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 you know, this uh, free and equal discussion and equal discussion, uh, uh, civil society, civil society, holding uh, against, so against feudalism, uh, state bureaucracy, very important capitalism, but also, also, also maybe, maybe against uh, flame wars. 
So, and I, I've, I've mentioned these ideal types somewhere. Yeah, so free and equal discussion as opposed to patrimonialism, as opposed to capitalism, as opposed to state bureaucracy, and opposed to flame wars, right? Um, and again, so, 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 so I've, I've been talking about, so, you know, uh, uh, I feel in a very important sense, right? So males have common interests with females. Again, it's like, this is, this is really so, I feel so appalling. I, I, I feel Zizek talks about something like this, right? So um, I should make a disclaimer. I, I do not live in United States, United States of America. I've been to United States of America once a long time ago. I don't really have any... Well, I, I, I by and large, I have very few friends from America, and we don't discuss American politics. And I my knowledge of America is very superficial. Right? I specialize in classical political philosophy. You know, Plato, Hobbes, that kind of thing. I have very little idea what, have, what goes on in America. But from what... So this is an important disclaimer. But from what I've heard, there's been some talk about, you know, increasing the minimum wage to $15 uh, per hour or something like that, right? And I feel it's like... You know, it's like a, as, as, a, as a socialist, you know, as a continental socialist Marxist, I, I, I'm appalled by that because you know, fifteen dollars an hour is is a is a is a, uh, uh, is a um, indecently low wage, and so you see, male workers fight against female workers for in America for table scraps. You know, minimum wage should be maybe fifty dollars an hour, maybe a hundred dollars an hour, but not fifteen. But and they don't even have fifteen in most places, as far as I understand. So likewise, you know, black workers fight against white workers. And for me, the question is why we have a common interest. Likewise, animal welfare. So again, I just mentioned that I haven't thought about this for too long, but I feel that, you know, probably it's not clear to me if we should, you know, treat uh, uh, animals on the same level as humans. It's like I'm not persuaded by Peter Zinger's arguments, for example. But still, it is very clear that us and animals, we have huge overlapping common interests. Right? So, in terms of it's like the, the practice of factory farming, you know, uh, uh, the use of antibiotics, the use of hormones, uh, um, spreading of diseases, right? So, the fact that uh, animals are cramped together and it's like um, provide certain special breeding grounds for pathogens, pathogens, right? so etc. Right? So, you know, it's like very often, you know, people will, you know, there's a, there's a clear thing that we need to do. We need to regulate the meat industry to hold it accountable and transparent, to make it more accountable and transparent, mm -hmm. transparent and accountable. And you see, I'm a single issue person. I feel that if you get, you know, you understand, socialism or barbarism. If you get socialism, if you get socialism, right? Let me, let me, let me, let me write this somewhere. Socialism or barbarism. Because if we get socialism, if we allow people, if we give people enough resources to participate and to hold uh, uh, um, the states, the state apparatus, and capitalist system, if we, if we allow the individuals to hold them transparent and accountable, then we will solve uh, uh, animal cruelty. But if we don't, we won't solve animal cruelty. <laughs> right? And again, it's like, maybe you, maybe you care. For the for, for the welfare of animals, and I'm not I'm not going to say I don't care about animal welfare. You know, it's like I don't like seeing gratuitous suffering, right? But it's it's one thing to talk about what you like, what I like, what our per you know. This is a question of personal preferences. Over and above that, there are very serious concerns that have to do with again antibiotics, hormones, pathogens. Not to mention that again, if some people in the slaughterhouses are cruel for cruelty's sake, unnecessary cruelty. Maybe that's a bad thing for society in general. Maybe we don't want people to be cruel. Maybe it's like, it's like, like when we bring up children, we don't teach them to be cruel. Right? It's like if, if your child tortures a cat, even if, it's just, even if it's a stray cat, even if you don't care about cats, this sets off some alarm bells in your head. Like, you know, maybe my child is not developing properly. Maybe I'm not, being, you know, maybe I'm not doing a very good, good job of a parent, regardless of the welfare of the cat. Right? And so what I want to say is that, come on, people, we have this huge overlapping interest. Even with ethical vegans, we have a huge overlapping interest. Let's focus on the common interest. Let's appeal to the common interest. Right? And, but instead, instead, what we get very often is flame wars. And people talk about how social media is divisive and how social media actually ruins uh, um, um, humanity 
And I'm not sure, I haven't done a study. You know, it sounds like a bombastic conclusion. I'm not sure if it's actually true. It's like to sit down and calculate how much good uh, internet does and how much harm internet does. Is very, you know, you get, you get flame wars on Twitter, but you also get Wiki free Wiki Wikipedia, basically everywhere you get internet access. So it's like, you know, it's a trade-off. But what, what I'm driving at is like, <laughs> I want to focus on this, on common interest. And again, it's like, I, when I was planning this whole discussion, I wanted to say that, Mm. Should I talk about, you know, biases and class biases and whatever? <sighs> so, okay, it's like, I'm not sure if I should be saying this. Maybe it's oversharing and, and maybe I'll regret saying this later. But, you know, I'll never know before before I say it, whether I'll regret it or not. So, so this is a test case. Again, I, I remind you, all, all this stuff is me preparing for September. Uh, slavery was abolished uh, in 1861 in uh, Russia, right? So, well, it's like, I, I may wanna try to conceal the fact from YouTube, like I, I try to take this cosmopolitan perspective, I tr try not to talk about my ethnic background, but I feel that the geometry of my face and also my name kind of gives away, gives away the game, right? So, um, only several generations ago, my grandparents were bought and sold Okay, so when people talk about this all this stuff about white privilege and slavery and whatever, it's like, uh, as far as I remember, but I'm not a linguist, but the word slave actually comes from the word Slav. Because uh, uh, in the Middle Ages, in Europe, um, sl sl you know, you were not supposed to trade people. People were not supposed to be bought and sold. But this person, they're not a, per they're not a person, they're, they're a Slav. So, so, so it's okay for them to be a slave. And this is as far as I understand how etymology works. If I'm wrong, please correct me. But this is last time I checked. This was the etymology. Again, I'm ethnically a Slav. Again, I, I don't want to harp on it. I don't want to advertise it. But I feel that maybe, maybe, maybe I should, maybe I should, uh, 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 you know, uh, you know, talk about this for the sake of the argument, right? And and, and likewise, people can say, oh, uh, uh, Alex, um, well, you, you have this all this fancy equipment, this you know house, whatever. You're cl you're clearly middle class, maybe upper middle class, and, and you are talking about communism. You know, what kind of common interest do you have with the poor? And again, it's a I'm not comfortable talking about this, but maybe I should mention it's like there was a period in my life uh, um, where uh, you know I was really financially struggling, and this was a very interesting experience. It was actually it was actually a very uh, fruitful experience because um, I've, I think I've understood Marx back then um, in a deep sense. You know, it's like in a visceral way in which it's difficult to understand otherwise. It's like let me let me explain. Like not not the plight of the poor and all that all that other stuff because I feel again I agree with Paul Bloom I feel that empathy usually does more harm than good so I'm not talking about empathy empathy usually pe leads people astray because it's emotional right what I understood was conceptual what I understood was if I want to buy something for example a phone if I want to buy it it will cost me hours of my life it will it will cost me metaphorically speaking deciliters of my blood. You know, milligrams of my blood, right? And and this is when Marx talks about commodity fetishism. I feel this is what Marx's ultimate point is: is that what gets exchanged in the market are not abstract objects. You know, abstract phone for abstract money. No, 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 no. It's hours or or minutes or or maybe days or maybe years of slave labor for for years of slave labor. Well, slave labor. Talking about wage slave labor. And again, I don't, I'm not trying to appeal to emotions. I'm not saying, oh, please empathize with the poor or please empathize with me when I was poor. No, 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 no. I'm saying, what can we do that would be in the common interest that would make everybody better off? And again, notice, just talking about how the poor are poor and, and suffering, this could lead to many different conclusions. So maybe your own personal conclusion would be that private charity is an answer. But to me, that's the whole point. And this is, this is my other whole other pet peeve. So uh, uh, I want to say that Capitalism is a systematic problem. Systematic problems need to have systematic solutions. So it shouldn't be that so, so like private charity, private charity, or private fairness, whatever that means. Uh, uh, um, I don't, I'm not sure if these are good uh, um, Solutions and in fact they may be deleterious. Again, this notion that you know, well, some people uh, give pity to the poor, they you know provide some charitable contributions, and so the life of the poor is not is not completely appallingly bad. And so people get stuck. It's like this path dependence, path dependence. 
right? So you like in, in so private charity may be with a question mark. Instead of solving the problem of poverty, it perpetuates suffering. It's like why? Because you're curing the you're not you're not curing the symptom, you're alleviating the symptom. Again, I don't want to be categorical with a question mark. Maybe sometimes it's alleviating the symptom instead of curing the cause, the cause of the root cause of the disease, right? This would be this would be the assertion. Um, and it's like a, a huge pet peeve of mine is ethical consumption. Because I want to say that if you care about the environment, so like you see, I'm a single issue person. I think it's social and barbarism, and our first task has to be social. So, so solving, uh, um, again, making sure that free and equal discussion is in control. Um, I feel that it's like ethical consumption is a, is a, is a, is a big scam. Uh, well, it's like, again, sorry, 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 sorry. But with a, with a question, with a question mark. Again, the, sa the same thing. Path dependence, alleviating symptom instead of curing the disease. See, it's like, okay, you personally, you are not going to eat meat. Or you personally, you're going to buy um, ethically sourced, ethically produced food or, or, or clothing or something like that. But you see, the I mean, we're all interconnected, right? So it's like somebody sells you uh, let's say an ethically made bag, ethically sourced bag, and then they reap a profit. Let's say, and they use this profit to buy something else, right? Or, or, or it's like you have uh, maybe you own a house, or maybe you have uh, you know um, um, a bank account, or like sa you know, savings, um, retirement savings. Right? How does your bank use your retirement savings? It's like, like we are all we're implicated in the system. It's it's useless. To, I don't want to say it's useless. It's um. Uh, it's deeply dishonest to imagine that somehow you can go off the grid and just be ethical. It's like what I'm driving at is ethical consumption is like I'm going to pay a premium. I'm going to pay more money so that it's like, like in, in feudalism, a lord condemns somebody to death and then the executor kills them. You know, the, the executioner executes the criminal, kills the criminal. And the lord says, well, in front of God, my conscience is clear. I didn't kill that man. It was the executioner. The executioner ha has this sin on their soul. Like, to me, this is what ethical consumption is. I pay more money for other people to consume unethically. Because, you see, like, if, if, if a vegan, it's like a healthy vegan option, costs more in the place when you, where you live, or, you know, ethically sourced coffee, or ethically sourced pant bags, or something like that, costs more in the place where you live, you're just outsourcing this... <laughs> Misery, you know, sorry, out, outsourcing the unethical consumption to other people so that, uh, you know, the poor people will consume unethically for you. Because guess what? The, you know, the people who produce your ethically made, made ethically sourced handbags or ethically, ethically sourced uh, cocoa beans uh, or coffee beans, probably they do not have the luxury. It's like, you know, it's like ethical consumption is a kind of luxury. Um, and, of course, that's not to say that people don't waste. That's not to say that people don't waste. But, of course, people waste a lot. But I feel, and again, questions of waste and reciprocity. Because, you see, it sounds very bizarre. Because some people are going to say, oh, look, you have a phone. You could have bought a cheaper phone or could decide to not get a phone. And, and you would reduce your carbon footprint. But at the same time, there are you know, plenty of people in the world today who don't, just don't care about that. And they want to get as, a, as an expensive car as they can. They want to get you know, drunk every day. They want to party. And they just don't care about this thing, these things. And it's like, for me, a Hobbesian in me asks, what about reciprocity? Right? And, and likewise, I feel that, or, 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 talk about waste, there was this uh, recent, f you know, or fairly recent scandal. I'm not sure if it's a scandal. This notion that, you know, uh, uh, um, people pat themselves on the back in the first in the countries of the first world because they recycle. But actually, what happens with their waste? It gets to uh, uh, shipping containers. So shipped, you know, waste shipped to China, shipped 
to China. This is, I'm, I'm not saying this very clearly, and again, I apologize, this, I remind you, it's, it's a draft. And by the way, if you want to contribute to this, if you want to clarify or correct some of the things I've said, by all means, feel free to contribute. But again, I talked about ethical consumption. So you, you, you pay a premium in order to absorb your soul, but in fact, you're not contributing to anything. Something very similar happens here. You pay a premium, you, you, uh, let's say, you, you spend additional time on recycling properly, but then what happens to your recycled waste is get shipped off to China, where it's actually not taken care of in any, in, in any you know, environmentally friendly sh sh uh, shape, matter, or form. But it's like, it's not you who are polluting the environment. It's the Chinese because they mismanaged your waste. You see? You see, you see kind of the problem with that? Because, again, we, we are in this system together. John Locke has this wonderful phrase. You know, it's like, who bakes your bread? Who makes the flour uh, 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 for your bread? Who... You know, who feeds the people who uh, make your bread? Who makes the ships on which raw materials are shipped for the people who make the food for the people who, break your who bake your bread? You understand, like, what we're driving at is that the production chain is so incredibly intertwined that you imagine that somehow cutting out a particular product from your life, you're going to make a huge difference. That sounds deeply implausible to me. You could say, Alex, what makes a huge difference? I'll tell you what, 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 what again, I'm not sure. But at this stage of my life, I feel that the thing that makes most difference is uh, uh, um, Gramscian intellectual war of position. Socialism or barbarism. We need to, you know, it's like wh whatever contributes to that, whatever contributes to the free and equal discussion. If you can uh, offer high quality educational content on YouTube for free, excellent. You're, con you're contributing in a good way. If you can uh, uh, take an argument which was a flame war and now you have turned it into a productive discussion, okay, excellent. Like, so, like to, to me, the, the rule of thumb is, again, socialism or barbarism. It's a bit of an oversimplification, but I think it's, it's a good enough oversimplification. Um, mm, I'm sure there was a lot of other things I wanted to mention. I, I kept talking about, yeah, so I, I, I kept talking about my own personal background in the sense that I feel, you know, there's this huge toxicity <laughs> radiating from flame wars, especially having to do with uh, American politics, because, you know, America is the world hegemon, they're the, they're the loudest, so their, their problems get amplified. And I just, you know, uh, it's like, no, I mean, we shouldn't, again, you see, everything is interconnected, so we shouldn't just separate ourselves, because the safety that you enjoy and the safety that I enjoy is probably due to the American nuclear shield. So, like, all of our hands are, you know, smeared and... <laughs> <laughs> Campless blood, if you want. So again, let me let me let me say this as clearly as I can. So I don't want, I don't want to hate on America. I don't want to bash on America, right? So I, I feel that there's a common interest, and definitely there's a common interest between me and people of America. And I, I feel that there's even a, a deep interest between me and the American women and the uh, American poor and the American minorities. I feel that we have a common interest, right? And I want us to pursue this common interest. So I wish America all the best, right? But I'm, what, I, what I'm saying is that, you know, sometimes these issues get blown out of proportion, especially because of these, you know, partisan lines. It's Democrats versus Republicans. Like, you know, I'm, I'm sure some people would try to classify me, with, you know, without realizing that I'm so far removed from this context that it would be really quite preposterous. Uh, to imagine that I have any stake in the game or even any understanding of what of what of what the parties are or or what they do. Mm. Plague be upon both your houses, right? As Shakespeare says. Um, what we need is not Republicans or Democrats. We need free and equal discussion, as far as I can tell. Anyway, uh, uh, I'm afraid I've been rambling for too long, as always. And as always, I've run out of things I can say I hopefully somewhat clearly from the top of my head. I hope that this was stimulating. Again, it's like, this is this is a very important uh, 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 topic for me, talking about natural rights. And again, especially, especially underlying, cause, like, it's not like I oppose natural rights, therefore I want people to die and suffer. No, 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 no. There's a, there's a, um, there's a, I think there's a better alternative and everybody would be better off if we took this alternative. <laughs> the name of the alternative is common interest. Um, and again, let, let's not kill ourselves. I understand that it's a, it's a big question of how do we get from here to there? Because theoretically we have a common interest, but practically, especially, you know, realism and international relations, you know, it's like a, a rich country sponsors a poor country, and then the poor country, you know, uses this money to get nuclear weapons and now blackmail a rich country. You know, it's possible these things could happen, right? So I feel we need to have a Hobbesian underpinning uh, uh, underneath all of these discussions of, you know, uh, common interest, right? So it's like, Common interest is not uh, is not automatic. You need 
artificial mechanisms that you need to construct that will make sure, you know, to, to among other things, to avoid the free rider problem, to solve prisoners' dilemmas, right? So maybe, maybe a point for a future video. Well, anyway, anyway, uh, um, I think I'm going to wrap this up here. I hope this clarified some of the things because I very often talk about naturalized tradition and I never have the time in class to talk about it in more detail. So I hope you found this stimulating. And this is this is broadly speaking why I oppose Locke and Kant, right? the opposition to natural law tradition. So uh, I hope this was clarifying. I hope this was stimulating. I hope this was maybe fun. Um, if, if you have any contributions, I'd be more than happy to hear them. Uh, uh, otherwise, colleagues, again, thank you so much for your company. Stay safe, take care, and I'll see you around.